Good morning, Kansas City. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. I am joined this morning by Dana Hawkinson. You know what I like to call him. Dr. Hawkeye, right. Dr. Hawk, <laughs> our uh, Medical Director of Infection Control. And we have a special guest today, Mario Castro. Mario is the Division Director for Pulmonary and Critical Care of Medicine. He is also the head of our clinical translational science and research efforts here at KU in our collaboration with multiple other institutions locally, including UMKC, St. Luke's, mm -hmm. the Osteopathic Medical School, mm -hmm. and uh, really across other areas around the state. So it's a really important position for us. And, and, and Mario has been intricately involved in research studies looking at COVID-19. And we're gonna ask him to comment on some of the things that, that, that he knows about. But first, I'm going to turn to Dr. Hawkinson. Dana, what are the numbers like this morning? How are things looking? Big weekend. Yeah, hi. You know, luckily our numbers are still uh, good for what that's worth. Uh, they are about the same as they were last week. We have 31 in-house. But we currently have almost half of those uh, in the ICU, so that's actually not good, especially if it's taking a trend toward the more critically ill patients. And Mario, you, you've been part uh, here for a while, but you also came mm -hmm. from St. Louis at Washington University. Right. I know you've been in contact with some of your colleagues there. Yes, I've been in touch with my colleagues there. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the social distancing just did not work on that side of the state. And St. Louis has a congregation of, of uh, um, individuals that, you know, were not distancing themselves. And I, I think that resulted in a lot more cases ended up in the hospital. and. In the ICUs there, they have over 50 patients on the ventilators, which is about five, four to five times what we've been having here. Yeah. Uh, so it really makes a difference if you can stay at home, you know, and stay away from uh, uh, groups, and that allows uh, us not to spread this virus. It really does work. And again, hats off to the core four, Wyandotte, Johnson, Jackson County, and Kansas City, Missouri. Um, really kind of got ahead of this curve, and I think it's really affecting the curve in our area. We've been seeing yeah. relatively flat numbers here, which is great, which is not what St. Louis has been experiencing, I know. Right. Talk to us a little bit about some of the research studies that you have and that you're helping work with here at KU around COVID-19. Sure. Well, I think it's a, an exciting time because we as clinicians taking care of COVID um, really are uh, struggling to know what exactly should we use for treatment. Right. Um, we know supportive care, helping people with you know, breathing, oxygen, those things get people through this uh, crisis and through this infection. But we've been using a lot of other medications with our ID colleagues and, and so on that we're really just in the experimental stage, I would say. And it's not the way we like to practice medicine. We like to know what's the evidence behind it. So. I almost argue that every patient we should be treating should be in a study because we should be learning from every patient and, and what they can teach us. And so I just wanted to hit three studies this morning uh, briefly and, um, and, and really just share with you all kind of what we're trying to advance in terms of the knowledge. But there are over 40 studies that are being contemplated here uh, at KU Medical Center. And it's an exciting time, I think, uh, as we think about different approaches. You know, how can we treat this viral infection? Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the HERO study. I know that's yeah. going to be of really big interest to, to folks since it involves healthcare providers. Yeah. Well, HERO, as appropriately named, uh, is trying to save our healthcare workers. Uh, it's trying to come up with a strategy perhaps that will help us in terms of our healthcare workers that are being exposed to COVID. So we're proposing a study that's going to be rolled out across the entire United States, 60 different sites. Mm -hmm. We're aiming to enroll 15,000 healthcare workers. And by healthcare workers, we don't mean about you, Dr. Stites. Yeah, we no. mean. <laughs> we, People are really doing the work. Is that what you're saying, Mario? Right. Thanks a lot for that, bro. We mean about <laughs> the, you know, the nurses, the, you know, the, um, medical technicians, the people that are cleaning these rooms, you know, those are the people that are really being exposed um, and sacrificing and heroes in a sense to really be out there in the front line for us. And we know that protective gear works. We know that protective equipment yeah. works, but we don't know if a medication would help us uh, protect us. So the HERO study is gonna take um, a medication called hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. And this hydroxychloroquine is the medication that's been talked about a lot in the press. Uh, it's been used for a number of years for malaria uh, prevention. And so what we're doing is using it to prevent COVID. 
And so healthcare workers that would qualify for the HERO study um, would log on to a registry, and the registry is HEROES, H-E-R-O-E-S, research.org, and HEROESresearch.org, you just log on, anybody can do that, that's a healthcare worker, and from that registry, we are going to take uh, people that qualify, that are exposed to COVID, bring them here, uh, and then enter them into the study. Um, and they'll get 30 days worth of treatment, either hydroxychloroquine or placebo. So you get a, a flip of the coin, 50, 50% chance of whether or not you're gonna get the real thing. But we need to know, is this medication safe first mm -hmm. for healthcare workers? Because there are side effects with every medication we've been throwing at these our patients. And, and we need to also know, is it effective? Can it prevent COVID infections in our healthcare workers? And it's a striking reality, Steve, if you look at our colleagues in New York, in Seattle, 20, 30% of healthcare workers were infected with COVID. So uh, one out of five, one out of four chance is not very good for a healthcare worker. Yeah, you bet. So this would be a ch chance then to try and prevent that transmission by taking right. hydroxychloroquine and seeing if it improves the outcome for healthcare workers. And I think as we hear talk about reopening, Dana, that will be especially open, important because we don't have a vaccine yet. We don't have right. treatment. It just means that there's going to be a level of uh, SARS-CoV-2 with us for a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that also goes to the point of, well, healthcare workers are getting infected at the same rates of community people as well. So mm -hmm. this may also, if they're continuing to take it on a once daily basis or whatever the regimen is, um, would that help prevent community spread? And again, keep our healthcare workers safe and healthy so they can come in and treat the patients. So with that um, introduction, I'd love to open up to questions that, that any uh, uh, folks out there might have. This is Cher from Fox 4. Good morning, hope everyone had a great weekend. Um, quick question, I just saw a John Hopkins study that says coronavirus can now spread on shoes up to 13 feet and that it can live on that surface for, I think it said up to three days, if not cleaned. Uh, speaking of healthcare workers and all the gears that you're taking, I'm assuming that they're changing shoes and their booties, I'm guessing, that they wear over their shoes and mopping floors. Have you seen that study or have a reaction to it? Dan, I'll turn to you. Um, yeah, uh, last night, I don't know if, if this was the John Hopkins study. Um, certainly I saw a study out of China that was indicating uh, that they were also looking at the virus on surfaces. Again, they were detecting most of these studies that they are uh, detecting the, the virus on surfaces, things of that nature. For the most part, again, it's, it's RNA detection. It's the genome detection. So we, we, it's not really clear if it's actually infectious particles, but rather maybe debris from the virus itself. Um, and I would have to look at that study in general. But we know that it can be detected on different surfaces for you know up to three, seven days. Um, this is probably similar, I'd have to look at that, but the question is, even though we're detecting it, and certainly if it's, um, I guess, expelled from the body mm -hmm. during cough or sneeze in any short amount of time within an hour or two, you could still probably abs absolutely detect it. It may be infectious at that point, um, but a lot of these studies are just detecting the RNA and they don't really make inferences of it's infective, and so we'd have to look at that. But we know that it, it can be detected on different surfaces for some amount of time. Yeah, I think the key is there's virus particles that can be detected. Those are not infectious to people. You have to have the virus, and the virus has to be culturable in order to know that it's growing and therefore can be infective to someone else. And and um, um, I don't I don't know about that either. We can look at that to get back to you. I'm not sure I've seen that. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. I'll have to go back and find the, the Hopkins study, but I bet it's the, the Wuhan data. So we'll, 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 we'll get back with you about that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Hey, Dr. Seitz. This is Mike Sherry from KCPT. Good morning. Um, I understand that there's been almost an unlevel, uh, uh, um, unprecedented level of communication and discussion among chief medical officers during this. Can you talk about how often you talk to your colleagues at various hospitals and what the topics are and how this bodes maybe for future cooperation? Yeah, that's a great question. Man, that's like that's like a softball right there. I appreciate that. <laughs> I know, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I don't, don't apologize. I'm happy about it. No, you know what? Um, hospitals are by their nature competitive. We're all out there trying to get business that, you know, take care of folks, but also be successful. And chief medical officers are like that. 
But at a time of a pandemic, it's a lot more important to work together than it is to work apart. And so we've had calls three times a week just to touch base about how things are going at each of the institution, help answer questions that each other might have, share our experiences, and really work together around things like you know, OR schedules and clinic schedules and personal protective equipment and the rules around infection control, and then trying to come together to help ourselves all understand where everybody is, make sure we're giving the right messages to our, our CEOs and to um, you know, the emergency medical uh, crews that are out there. And, and the goal is that you know, we're all going to have to take care of COVID-19 patients, and we want to do the best job possible. Um, I think any time you forge a relationship with people, then those relationships can help sustain you um, across the enterprise and at, at across the future. So I do think it's going to help us in the long run. You know, I, I, I think if there's been an unprecedented degree of cooperation between KU and uh, multiple health systems, in, including St. Luke's and, and Liberty and North Kansas City, Shawnee Mission and uh, Olathe and, and, you know, Lawrence Memorial and others as we shared information. And so that's been... I mean, there aren't a lot of wins for the world in uh, uh, this infection um, and what it's done to our community and, and to our economy and, and to our health. But if there is a win, it's in people coming together to accomplish a greater good. And that's what you hope you can hold on to as you go into a period of recovery. And, and remember that even as we go from, you know, this policy of, uh, you know, shelter at home and things like that, Eventually, the day after tomorrow comes, and you have to resemble, uh, resume some part of normal life. COVID-19 as a disease is going to have to be with us for a long time until we have a vaccine or meaningful therapy for it. Because that is a true statement, and it is a very true statement, then what we have to do is work together to help monitor how the community's doing as you begin to reopen it. And I don't know how, the, how that's going to be all handled politically, but I know from a, the standpoint of our chief medical officers across our, our area, um, I think it's, it's really important that we stay in touch to know what's going on in our hospitals so we get early signs of any kind of rise as, as we talk about reopening. The other thing I would just say is we've, all, we've also worked together in educating our region, Western Missouri and Kansas, because we've been in conversations with chief medical officers throughout mm -hmm. our bi-state area. I think, I think that's been a big win. So, yeah, we've been in so. touch with uh, ICU uh, critical care directors in the region, which has been the first for us. Uh, and I should point out, Mario has helped <laughs> lead that, um, and, and, and what that meant is he early identified, hey, gosh, we have to think about ventilators as a resource as right. well, so let's start planning for that, because we know that that's what ran out in New York and Italy yep. and other places. Exactly. So one of the first steps we took is, you know, when you plan in public health, you need to assess what's, ha what's the potential here. And so... Every uh, critical care director we met and uh, by Zoom, uh, as we all meet nowadays, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we assessed how many ventilators do we currently have, ICU beds, and then how many could we have at each hospital with the idea of any one of us are being overwhelmed. We could reach to our neighbors, even across the health system, and, and say, hey, I don't want to resort to uh, drastic measures of triage. I want to send it, uh, this patient over to be to cared a place that has that capacity. Right, and we could either trade. We could transfer patients, or we could transfer ventilators too, yep, because exactly. that, some rules have gotten a little easier around that for us. So, yep. other questions? Yeah. Hi, my um, my name is Celia with Kansas News Service. Um, I have a couple questions about testing. So, where are you guys? I know you guys have in-house testing now. Um, what, how are your criteria compared to the state lab's criteria in terms of, you know, can you test more people who maybe aren't sick enough to be hospitalized? Yeah, so, you know, the testing criteria tends to move every day, uh, <laughs> and that's not a criticism, it's a statement. And it's that way because um, differing uh, equipment may be working run one day, not working as well on another day. So we, we are able to test quite a few folks here, and, and we have some additional testing and we've got two different types of equipment that are doing it um, and so our criteria has really been any inpatient um, people who are undergoing certain kinds of procedures which may generate an aerosol and it may you know like a sinus surgery could, could have the have the virus go airborne so we would want to know about that 
um, as well as our healthcare employees and select patient populations. We've not opened it up more broadly. There are some places that have opened it up more broadly because they think they have the testing capacity, but even that varies from day to day based upon um, really uh, how well that equipment's performing on any given day. The other thing is that we feel like it's really important to do all the folks who are called um, uh, patients or people under investigation or what we call rule outs for short. And, and the reason we do that is if you're in the hospital as a rule out, you're using up all sorts of PPE, personal protective equipment. And so we think that's the most important thing to, if we don't have to do that, let's stop it. And I think I would say based on our CMO calls, everybody's approach is the same. We're gonna make sure that we got all the patients we need to test tested We've got all our employees tested so they can be on the front line taking care of folks. And then we have special disease populations and then we might be able to broaden that a little bit. The state of Kansas and KDHE and, and, and the health departments are all getting more equipment in. Um, we are all trying to get more equipment in because we recognize that from a public health perspective, if we're going to start opening up society, one of the most important things you can do is have broad and easily accessed easily accessible testing um, so that you can help manage how many patients with COVID-19 are out in the community. I don't know if either of y'all have anything to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Our testing is still um, looking for, again, evidence of the virus. It's a uh, nucleic acid test. We still haven't gotten into the serology or the antibodies. We've talked about that last week. Eventually, as Dr. Stites talked about, we would like to, to like to, uh, so that we understand the full prevalence of the disease out in the community at this time, and also looking back to see if other people were exposed and maybe just not as ill. Yeah, so there will be, I think this area is gonna change dramatically over the next, oh gosh, I wanna be an optimist to say two weeks, but the, really by the first of June, I think, we'll have te I think we'll have a lot broader testing capability across our region. I think most hospitals have developed their own in-house tests or have gotten their own in-house tests. And we got, and the other important piece is you have to have the swabs and the serology, mm -hmm. and, or not the serology, the, uh, the viral medium, in order to be able to run those and uh, the reagents. And so all of that has to be in place from a supply chain perspective to really open up our, our testing capability as high as all of us want to do. Because make no mistake, we all want to accelerate the amount of testing available. Um, and then I wonder if I could fo follow up. So I wonder what you guys are hearing about how things should work for people who are uninsured. There are two pieces to this. Um, you know, one, of course, one of the stimulus bills includes um, the idea that uh, testing should be free for people who are uninsured and that money should eventually flow through Medicaid. So I wonder, have you guys received the logistical information you need at this point to not bill uninsured people and instead bill Medicaid for that. And then um, the Trump administration has also said that they want to spend part of the CARES Act on um, treatment for uninsured people, but it seems there are a lot of unanswered questions. What information do you have at this point? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I, we have a lot of unanswered questions as well. Um, there's a lot open to some interpretation. Um, but we did get some of our first um, amounts in as a result of the CARES Act and other acts that are out there. I, I'll have to let you know specifically about whether or not we are getting reimbursed for the treatment of people without insurance under those. I don't know the answer to that question right now. I will say to you that um, um, we will test anybody. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that's not right. If you're um, someone who needs a test here, but based on the criteria we set out earlier, we'll, we'll test anybody, and we have been doing that. Um, I think the point that no one should have to pay for a test and everybody needs that needs to get tested can get tested, that is true. We all want and aspire to that. We need greater testing capability to match that statement right now because we still have limited testing capability um, really for the most part across the region um, we really have to stratify, uh, but one of the things we, we don't stratify is your ability to pay in relationship to um, a, a test for SARS-CoV-2. Hey, uh, Mario, th uh, this is Mike with KCP again. Um, Hi, Mike. Do you have a sense as to, I, I, got, in, I got knocked off the call earlier, so I, can't, I didn't um, hear exactly what your, your role is, but um, do you, do you have a sense that, that, that there's enough ICU beds available um, throughout the region? 
Yeah, we've been uh, planning this for about four weeks now where every one of the critical care directors in the regional hospitals have been getting together. And uh, we looked at how many ICU beds we currently have, how many ventilators we currently have. And then if push comes to shove, if we have a lot of COVID patients going into the ICU, what is our surge capacity? And, uh, and we're quite impressed, I mean, that we can actually use ventilators that are in the OR, other locations that we typically don't use uh, with critical care supervision uh, adequately to treat patients. And so uh, we hope, you know, that we're not in a situation that our colleagues in, uh, in other regions of the country and that uh, we have that capacity. Um, but we're, you know, we're close to over a thousand ICU beds in the region available to uh, accommodate our patients if need be. And I think, you know, we keep looking at all the different models and it depends on which day of the week and which model you want to look at. Mm -hmm. We either have plenty of beds or we have nowhere near enough beds. <laughs> and, and the only way we're gonna know that is by walking the path together and figuring it out as, as we get through that, I think. Other questions? Yeah, it does seem to be fairly wild. Um, very, I mean, there's a lot of sort of gloom and doom out there. I mean, even the Missouri Association has put out some stuff that updated the uh, Harvard stuff. So it's, I mean, based on, based on what you're seeing now, you know, as we reach the peak, how do you all feel about the availability of ventilators and ICU beds and things like that? Here in Kansas City or across our region? Is there, in the Kansas different? City. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll um, Mario, do you have a, I'll answer, do you have a sense of that? And I, right. I think we have the capacity currently with, with what we're dealing I with, and too. our hope is that we've blended the curve and we'll have this low level of capacity, you know, uh, uh, ICU ventilators that we will have readily available. Um, so I, right now we're knock on wood somewhere. <laughs> we're, very, yeah. we're very, I usually uh, use my head fortunate. for that because that works pretty well. <laughs> but you know, um, I have COVID dreams and I wake up almost every night thinking, oh my gosh, what do we not do? What do we not think of? How did that happen? And, um, um, they're, they're not pleasant dreams. Um, but the, but the, the data, I think Dana suggests that we may have helped blunt the curve a little bit by the very early shelter in place from the core four. I, yeah. you just guys, you just, that was really good. I, I, I don't know how to say it any other way. And, and I think that that's been helpful now without widespread testing, we don't really know the incidents in the community. What we know is the number of hospital admissions we have and the number of ventilators we have. And so that that's an imperfect measure, but as a measure, we're not seeing a huge rapid rise, but that's not to say it won't come. Um, we are, are, are you know, if you look at the different data sets, it can suggest we are going to peak somewhere um, in, uh, in about a, two weeks, 10 to 14 days, all the way up until the 1st of June. So we have a lot of time to try and find out where we're gonna land. And the more data we have, the better off we are. But we're, we're still, unfortunately, I think I described this once before as a baseball game. And I said, we're still in the first inning. We're out of the first inning. We're, we're still behind, the score we're still behind, but we're not way behind like, you know, some areas of the country are, or regions of the world. But I say, would say we're still in the second inning, maybe getting into the third, but, but we got a long ways to go, a lot of baseball to play, Dana. Yeah, you know, I was again out at the uh, park this weekend and was able to smell the blooms, so I'm pretty sure, hopefully I don't have COVID. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can still smell. Um, but I, I think it's overall looking good. The real concern is that I did see a lot of young people congregating together. So I, I think it's imperative on, on the parents or the guardians to really try and tell them, you know, please stay away apart from each other because it only takes one or two from another household to bring it home to mom and dad, to grandma, to grandpa. Um, you know, I do think Governor Kelly and Secretary Dr. Norman were ahead of the curve nationally. I think uh, Mayor Lucas was ahead of the curve, especially in Missouri to try and do the shelter in place, stay at home, and hopefully blunt that curve, but we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah, it's really good, I think, fortuitous for us, political yeah. leadership, and you look at the difference between Kansas City and St. Louis, and just to say that's the opposite of yeah. the influenza epidemic of, two, of 1918, and, yeah. and uh, when Kansas City did not shelter in place and had a higher mortality rate than St. Louis, so. Other questions? 
Well, this uh, this, is, this what, is Melissa, Channel 41. Um, speaking of the models that you just referenced, um, if, looking ahead several months, you know, June and on, it's not showing death here in the metro, but is that because the data just doesn't exist that far in advance? And I'm talking about the uh, Washington University model. Yeah, you, you mean University of Washington, Washington model, yeah. I think. Correct, sorry. Yeah, so those guys, you know, they're very smart. Um, well, they, they, they said that predicting a situation like a pandemic that has never happened before in a, in a modern age, it's been over a century, um, and trying to figure out with a respirable, meaning when you breathe in and out pathogen, what it's going to mean is a lot like doing a long-range weather forecast. And, you know, those aren't the most reliable, no, not I'm not trying to impugn our weather forecasters, but it's just hard. <laughs> and so I think that's why the University of Washington model tends to, to uh, end a, a few you know, weeks out, and you're trying to figure out what it means. And, and partly because we don't know the extent of community spread. And so the University of Washington model uses deaths in order to calculate that curve. Well, think about this, right? So you don't really start manifesting symptoms after you've been infected with SARS-CoV-2 for anywhere from two to 10 days afterwards. It takes seven to 10 days after that to get sick and a few more days to end up in the ICU on a ventilator. So you're looking at a 10 or 14 day lag before you're even on the ventilator. And then most patients who are on a ventilator before they die are on that ventilator for 10 or 11 days. So really deaths lag anywhere from two to three weeks behind where you are in the community. So as a result, we you have to be a little careful. Deaths are a they're a very real denominator. They give you real good data, but it's a real long lag, and, and, and it's kind of depressing. So what the University of Washington is saying is we're not sure what that future looks like because we're also not sure what other interventions are out there, and it's just hard to explore the model. We'll make longer projections the more information and the more data we have. Here's what we know, though. This is a respirable pathogen. Coronaviruses tend to be around most all year long, but in differing levels in the community. We think this one may well act like that. We don't really know. But if it's like all the other coronaviruses, that was what will happen, which means that we're going to have some level of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, host the peak. And because we didn't infect a lot of people in the population, because we did shelter at place, which saved lives, it may still have a lot of people who are susceptible. So it just means that for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to be really careful. And that as much as possible, you're going to have to stay six feet away. Wash your hands for 20 seconds. Cough into your elbow. Don't go to work when you're sick. Monitor your temperature. And as possible, shelter in place. We know that at some level, you know, we're, we're healthcare folks, right? At some level, there's an economic and a social, social cost that those who are guiding us politically are going to have to weigh. But our job is to help with the health care side of that, and that's what we'll continue to do. Long-winded answer to say that's because they don't really know the future there at University of Washington, nor do we. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Dr. Stites, this is Mike. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, what's going to change, you know, how, this, how COVID is going to change the world. I'm interested in your thoughts on what's not going to change in the medical system um, once this is over with. You've already talked a little bit about that this is a competitive healthcare environment. I mean, I don't suppose you're all going to be joining hands and um, singing around the campfire for the rest of, of, of your lives. Um, so what is not going to change? Well, that's a great question. Okay, I'm going to take a stab at it. I think it's going to depend on how darn hot the campfire is. <laughs> Just, um, here's what I would say. At some point, we're all going to have to say we've got enough personal protective equipment and enough pharmacy supplies that we can reopen operating rooms and clinics. You know, that's really why we closed them to begin with, along with the need to not introduce more risk to individuals who came in for those things. We'll have to have enough testing in order to test patients the day before the day of surgery. Uh, to make Because we do know that patients who have operations are at increased risk if they have COVID-19 and they don't fare particularly well. So you don't want to do a surgery on anybody and because there's an asymptomatic state, you're going to have to test. Um, I think at some point in the future, we're going to have to open those things back up because there are patients who are delaying surgeries. They're not 
emergency surgeries, let's say you need to have a hip replaced or a knee replaced, but those, those hurt. And the only effective therapy is to get that done. And so once we understand the disease and our, our supplies a little better and we can test well, and we know that somebody can go back home to a safe environment and do physical therapy, perhaps on Zoom, um, or whatever the recovery thing may be, then I think we're gonna have to start accelerating our ability to care for folks. The good news is that because telemedicine has taken off so remarkably, which is a great outcome of this. Mario was talking about mm -hmm. being excited. He didn't mean excited, I'm joyful, but it, <laughs> be excited because we have a problem to solve and that's our job. Yep. I think telemedicine has excited us because it's been our job to take care of people and we've been able to do that through telemedicine. I think that combination of things, testing, supplies, telemedicine, will allow hospitals and health systems to open back up to take care of patients. I think we're gonna be living in a changed world until there's vaccine and direct therapy available that we know is effective, and hopefully it'll be things like hydroxychloroquine or a tocil, uh, uh, I can't say it this morning, it's, it's, it's Monday morning. Tocilizumab, thank you. <laughs> I, need, I need an assist there. Um, uh, things like that that will help change remdesivir, that things that will help change the outcome of this disease. And I think once we do that and we understand it better, um, then we'll do a better job in offering more effective therapy and we can even be you know, more direct. I think hospitals are gonna be, have to be more competitive, but I think around COVID-19, we will always be cooperative because it takes a combined effort. I hope it means we're gonna be able to work together a little bit more. You know, one thing y'all need to remember is that health systems across the country have taken a huge financial hit as a result of this, because we've stopped those things that make the most money. And you know, that was, that's just altruism, right? There's no, we would have wanted to stop our operating rooms, we didn't want to stop the clinics, but we had to do it. And it was absolutely the right thing to do. And everybody in Kansas City did, came together and did it. So we all did the right thing, whether you're a for-profit, not-for-profit, it didn't matter, we all did the right thing. I think around COVID-19, we will all work together con to continue to do the right thing. Because if one or two hospitals in close in Kansas City, we don't have the capacity to take care of all those folks. We, we are not an overbedded community as we once were. So we really have to work together to make sure that we can, we can all uh, survive and, and, and that'll, that'll lift all boats. Which reminds me, I wanna to turn to Mario. There was an article that came out, some news that came out this weekend about lots of small clots being part of this disease, and mm -hmm. the importance of anticoagulation. Any comments on that early and often maybe? Sure, I mean, uh, I, I think it's one of those things we're learning as we go. Um, and the observations that physicians have made taking care of these patients is that they have a high propensity of, of blood clots, both uh, blood clots in the legs, but also the very small blood clots in the lungs. And so now most of our patients in the ICU were anticoagulating, we're putting on blood thinners. Um, and so we think that this virus does damage to the inside lining of the blood vessels, the endothelium. And because of that damage, it causes these micro thrombi to, to form. Um, this has not really been seen. I don't know, uh, Dana, if you can comment on that in other viral infections like this. No, certainly, um, you know, we have listservs that, that infectious disease and other physicians can go on, and, and they notice that fairly early. Um, I would agree. You know, we, we have heard of anosmia or olfactory neuroinvasion, which can maybe cause a lack of smell for other viral entities, um, especially upper respiratory viral entities. But certainly the propensity to cause the blood clots in this is, seems to be fairly unique at this point. Clots can be everywhere. They can affect heart, yeah. they can affect liver, they can affect yeah. kidneys, right? I mean, these yeah. patients have a high incidence of kidney failure too. Yeah, no, it's something that uh, we've been concerned about on the yeah. uh, the ventilator capacity, yeah. but it's also the potential dialysis. for dialysis yeah. is, uh, uh, a limiting factor, and so we've been really trying to work hard and in increasing our capacity for that as well. Other questions? Probably have time for one more question here. Uh, this is Sean from the health system. I have a, a question from Facebook. Okay. Um, we had just asked twice, um, have you seen results of treating patients with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin? <laughs> yeah, I'll turn to you two, the yeah. experts. Take All right, why don't you go first? I'll sure. I'll follow up. I, I think, um, like a lot of things, uh, when you're not uh, in the midst of things and you haven't really studied it well, uh, we don't know the, the true answer. Uh, at this point, azithromycin has fallen out of favor. 
but hydroxychloroquine is still our mainstay for treatment. Um, I would say that some of us have seen small improvements, but not dramatic improvements. Yeah, Dana? Yeah, and I would like to say, you know, certainly Dr. Castro was talking about azithromycin. You know, there are a lot of uh, caveats and problems with these studies that originally came out. One of those was a study out of a fr with a French researcher. Um, the journal that the study was published in actually took back their support for that journal article, and then that way azithromycin dropped off because of that. The other thing is the Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA, which is our main infectious disease physician body um, here in the United States, recently published treatment guidelines. And it should be noted that in all of the treatment guidelines and recommendations, it does say may consider use in a clinical trial format. Mm -hmm. And all of that evidence was weak evidence that they made that recommendation on. And so that just goes to show you there is still a large knowledge gap, and we are trying to figure that out by doing all of these trials. And we are working on it tirelessly day in, day, day out, to try and find the best treatment, the best mm -hmm. timing of treatment. Um, and so, however, there still is that large knowledge gap there. So as we uh, close today, final thoughts from either of you? Well, I just want to emphasize the HERO study. I, I'd like all healthcare workers, you know, in the region to, to participate uh, in the registry. It's heroesresearch.org, uh, and heroes with an E, and uh, and that's going to be exciting because uh, you know, 15,000 healthcare workers across the U.S. were going to enroll into this study and and hopefully come up with some important information. Yeah, that's a really big deal. I think <laughs> we we have to emphasize how important that is, Dana. Yeah. Um, again, it's still going to be cool uh, out, but it will be nicer and uh, temperatures are going to continue to warm. Please go outside, but again, please stay apart, stay away from other people who are not in your household because all it takes is one person to bring it to the household. Um, continue to wash your hands, don't touch your face, social distance, physical distance. So, you know, I've I'm, I'm just kind of an Ozarks guy. I love going down to the, to the Ozarks <laughs> and paddling around in a canoe. And um, missing that, obviously. Um, you know, sometimes in the morning, it, 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 it's a little misty. You can't quite see anything. You get on the river, and you're like, I wonder what's around that river bend. Not quite sure what's around that river bend. And um, that's kind of where we've been. We've not really known what's around the river bend here uh, with COVID-19. But what I think we can see is that maybe, just maybe, the, 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 the sun's kind of breaking through just a little bit, and, and maybe it's be getting to get in a little more focus. Um, but in order to get there, in order to do that, we still have to stay safe. So don't, so don't let up. Um, BKC. This region has done a remarkable job of sheltering in place, staying at home, staying six feet apart, washing your hands, coughing to your elbow, don't touch your face. And we know that because our data says that. So let's figure out what's around that river bend, but let's do it by staying safe. We'll get there together. And the good news is there hopefully is a lot of river left to paddle. So thank you all for listening. We'll be back tomorrow.